pleasure to be with you again for the third time. Uh, and uh, it really has been a joy uh, to open God's word with you and to look into this wonderful subject of the second coming, the Lord's return, or eschatology, as some people have called it. Um, and the old joke goes, if you don't understand everything about eschatology, don't worry, it's not the end of the world. But of course, uh, that is exactly what we're talking about tonight. Now, what I'd like to do this evening is um, zoom out a little bit, I suppose, and to look at a particular expression that we find in Ephesians and then trace it through the scriptures a little bit. So I'd like to ask you to turn to Ephesians, please, in chapter one. Ephesians and chapter one. Can I just say once again, thank you so much for the invitation to be with you. And can I also say uh, how encouraging it is to get to know you uh, at Bonus Baptist Church, because as I've commented a number of times, um, the, the fellowships in Scotland uh, who are engaged with this sort of subject and who uh, believe God's word um, wholeheartedly about his return are actually few and far between. And so it really is lovely to have fellowship with you in this way. And I just want to encourage you in that, uh, not to not to lose your, your interest in this area, because it is so vital, uh, but sadly so unfashionable uh, today. So Ephesians chapter one then, and before we read these verses, uh, let's just come before the Lord in prayer together. Almighty God and dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace this evening once again, and we come in the name of our lovely Saviour, the Lord Jesus, and we thank you for all that he means to us, all that he purchased for us at Calvary's cross. And Lord, we come in freedom tonight, we come in the freedom with which Christ has made us free, no longer subject to a yoke of bondage. And we come freely because we want to hear more from your word. We want to know more of you, Lord. We want to walk closely with you and to be like our saviour. We're so aware of all the aspects of our conduct and our character, which don't reflect him and which don't please you. And we do ask for your forgiveness for all of those. And we do pray, Lord, that you might lead us on uh, in likeness to the Lord Jesus and in love for him. So we pray that tonight, uh, by the Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us through your word and that it would be of benefit to us uh, to be together in this way. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, Ephesians chapter one, then, please. And we're going to read from verse seven, from verse seven. And there's just a particular phrase that I want to highlight for you. In him, that's in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Amen. And God will add his blessing to the reading of his word. God has a plan. God has a plan that is working out day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. And he has a plan for the fullness of time, for the fullness of time. Jesus Christ is the focus of these verses, of course, in Ephesians. And Ephesians lays out for us really, um, well, Ironside's commentary on Ephesians is simply called In the Heavenlies. And that's a good uh, title for a commentary on Ephesians, because Ephesians, more than perhaps any other epistle in the New Testament, pulls back the curtain for us uh, into the heavens and, uh, and Christ seated there at God's right hand. Colossians does as well, and they really are uh, handmaidens for each other. But Ephesians is particularly special uh, in the way that it pulls back the curtain of heaven uh, for us. The, uh, there's a prominent theme in Ephesians of the mystery of God's will seven times the mystery is mentioned in Ephesians but we're not focusing on the mystery tonight that could be a subject for another time but tonight we're thinking about this fullness of time what period is this speaking of the fullness of times well the word fullness is a fascinating word it's a Greek word pleromatos pleromatos a great word and I want just to direct your attention very quickly you don't necessarily need to turn to each of these but I want to direct your attention to three times it's used elsewhere in the New Testament. 
we can actually pick from a whole number. Just over in Colossians, remember we're told there that the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Christ bodily. The fullness of the Godhead bodily. So we could have read that, but there are three other uh, words I just want to, uh, three other uses of this word I want to point out to you. So if you want to turn to them, one is in Galatians. One is in Galatians in chapter four, just over a page or two uh, in your Bibles, Galatians chapter four. And here we read from verse three. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law and so on and so forth. And it's tempting to keep reading because it's so wonderful. But here we have this use of the word pleromatos, the fullness of time. And I just want to say just one thing really about each of these. So when we come to its use in Galatians, we're thinking about timing, about timing, perfect timing, the fullness of time had come that not a minute before, not a minute after, in God's prophetic program, the Lord Jesus is sent to that manger in Bethlehem and the virgin birth occurs in the fullness of time, the perfect completeness of timing. And then secondly, the second two I want to point out are both in Romans. And in Romans chapter 11, we're into that central section of Romans, Romans 9 to 11, which deals with the relationship between the church and Israel God's plans for the Jews in the future. Very important section of Romans, very much neglected and misunderstood. But Romans chapter 11, verse 11, we read about uh, the full inclusion of the Jews in the future. Romans 11, verse 11. So I asked, writes Paul, did they stumble in order that they might fall? So what he's pointing out here is that the Jews have stumbled. The Jews of the present day, of course, some of them have believed in Christ and we're delighted about that. We wish that was the case for more of them. And we support and pray for those who are reaching uh, Jews with the gospel. But on the whole, uh, present day Jews do not accept the messiahship of Christ. They have stumbled. But verse 11 asks, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means, rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, friends, that's one of the callings that is placed upon the church in our era, is to make Israel jealous. And yet, of course, sadly, because of um, what the church on the whole has come to believe about Israel, that God has set them aside permanently, that he has no more any uh, desires for them or any plans for them, we are not, on the whole, fulfilling that calling of making Israel jealous. So salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. And then verse 12, now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if, they'll, if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? And that word is pleromatos, the full inclusion. So if we have been blessed, if we have been blessed because of Israel's stumble, now the gospel has come to men and women like you and me. I don't think there are any Jews on the call tonight. I could be wrong. If I am, then forgive me. But most of us will be uh, Scottish Gentiles or Gentiles from elsewhere in the world. And we have been grafted in uh, to what God was doing in Israel. We have been blessed. We believe in the Jewish Messiah tonight, and we call him our Savior. We can call him my Jesus, my Savior, uh, even though he's the Messiah of the Jewish people. And yet there's coming a day when nationally Israel will recognize the Messiahship of Christ there in Jerusalem when he returns in power and glory. We talked about that uh, last time we were together. Remember, a fountain will be open uh, in Jerusalem for my people, etc., so if we've been blessed by their stumbling, how much more will we be blessed by their full inclusion nationally that's coming in the future? So the idea here is not so much of timing, but of completeness, of completeness. So when the fullness of time had come, timing, their full inclusion, completeness. And then just over the page to Romans 13, just over the page to Romans 13 and verse 10. And here, a very different use of the word. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law. So here, Paul is very simply saying this, that you could encompass the law really in the word love. Love for God, love for neighbor. And of course, the Lord Jesus does exactly that when he's talking about the greatest commandments, etc. Love is the fulfilling of the law. So we've got timing, 
We've got completeness and we've got fulfillment. Timing, completeness and fulfillment all being used the same very word, plero matos. And I want to suggest tonight, brothers and sisters, that this fullness of times that's coming in the future actually encompasses all of those. Perfect timing, the fullness of time will come one day. There will be a sense of absolute completeness to what God is going to do in the future. And there'll be fulfillment. There'll be the perfect fulfillment of every promise and prophecy uh, that God has ever made or given. Friends, the Bible is an unfolding story, isn't it? It's an unfolding story. Um, there was a minister called Graham Scroggy at Charlotte Chapel in days gone by, and he wrote a wonderful uh, commentary uh, on the Bible called The Unfolding Drama of Redemption. And I think that's a lovely title uh, because that really could summarise this book that we have before us, couldn't it? The Unfolding Drama of Redemption. You could summarise the Bible in a number of ways, couldn't you? You could call it the greatest love story ever told. Or you could, you could call it a great story of reconciliation. There's a broken relationship at the start and a reconciled relationship at the end. There's a number of ways you could summarise the Bible, but it is an unfolding story. What is the What are the vital parts of a story? When you're a child and you're learning to write an essay or a story, you learn very often, right on the first day, a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the beginning and the end of a story are vitally important, aren't they? And yet, brothers and sisters, I'm sure that you would recognise, uh, along with me tonight, that two areas of the Bible that are most under attack today and least believed are the beginning of the story and the end of the story. So the first six chapters of Genesis uh, begin to fade out of people's minds and the end of the story begins to fade out of people's minds. These have come under attack and yet we hold unswervingly and joyfully to these, that we believe in a creator God and we believe that he created according to the, the, the narrative we were given in the opening chapters of Genesis, and we believe what he has said about his son's return. So the beginning of the story and the end of the story, these are absolutely vital. If you were to ask the people of Bones, you go out into the high street and say, excuse me, sir, excuse me, madam, can I stop you for a moment? Where is history heading? Where is history heading? Well, they might give you a number of different answers. You might be an optimist, and they might say, well, we're going to make poverty history, and we're going to eradicate disease. That's going to be the last pandemic we'll ever have. Uh, we're making technological advances beyond belief. And we're going to make this world an equal place. We're going to really build a human paradise. And that's going to be done through my political party. No, my political party. No, my political party. So you might meet an optimist like that. Or you might run into a pessimist. And he might say, well, it's going to the dogs. The world is going to the dogs. We're headed for nuclear disaster. We're headed for economic failure. We're headed for all sorts, you know, worldwide pandemics that will make coronavirus look like nothing. You might meet a pessimist. But unfortunately, a lot of people in Scotland are neither optimists or pessimists about the future, but actually they don't much care. There's a lot of apathy out there. I don't much care. As long as I'm okay, as long as I'm okay, I don't much care where history is heading. I was just teaching recently um, about the reign of Hezekiah as it's depicted in Isaiah. I was preaching in Dundee on, on his reign. And there's a decline just towards the end of his reign, sadly. He was a good king, a very good king, and he was still commended as good, but pride crept in. We, we learn that in Chronicles. And he shows the Babylonians all of his treasure house. They come to see him, and they flatter him, and he shows them all of his treasure house and then the prophet comes, prophet Isaiah comes and says to him, you know, you're going to lose it all. You know, in the future, they're going to come and they're going to take you all into exile. And Hezekiah, uh, the last words we read about him in Isaiah are these, well, there'll be peace in my lifetime. So I don't much mind. There'll be peace in my lifetime. Well, that's the attitude of many people, unfortunately, in our modern world today, apathy. Now, what are you waiting for? Let me ask that question. What are you waiting for? What are we as New Testament Christians, as believers in the Bible, what are we waiting for? Well, if we were to ask various people that question, if we were to say to the patriarchs, what are you waiting for? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, what are you waiting for? They would say, well, we are waiting for the fulfillment of the covenant promises of God to our father Abraham. That's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for the fulfillment of the covenant promises. God said, 
he would give our father Abraham um, a land and a people and blessing. A land and people and blessing. And we're waiting for that fulfillment. If you were to ask Moses, if you were to ask Moses uh, and the people uh, under Pharaoh, what are you waiting for? They would say, well, national deliverance. National deliverance. We're waiting to be taken out from the yoke of this bondage in Egypt. If you were to ask the prophets, what are you waiting for? They'd say the Messiah to come and to establish his reign on the earth and make things fair again. If you were to ask David, what are you, uh, sorry, Daniel, what are you waiting for? Or Ezekiel, they would say, well, return from exile. Return from exile to be restored back to the promised land. Or crucially, interestingly, if you were to ask Simeon, or Anna, what are you waiting for? They would say the consolation of Israel, the redemption of Jerusalem. We're waiting for a boy child. He's going to be born in the town of Bethlehem. And when he came, they saw and they recognized. So it's an important question. What are we waiting for? Well, two weeks ago, we covered it, friends, that we are waiting for his son from heaven who delivers us from the wrath to come. First Thessalonians 1, verses 9 and 10, that reinforces that for us, that we are waiting for his son from heaven, who delivers us from the wrath to come. We're not waiting for the Antichrist. We're not waiting for economic disaster. We're not waiting for the, the, the 666 or uh, for microchips to be implanted in us. Any one of these things might happen in the future, and some of them certainly will happen, but we are simply waiting for one event, the next event on God's prophetic program, and that is the rapture, when he comes to take us home according to his promise. But the rapture is not the end, is it? The rapture is not the end. And we covered that in our second week, that there's coming a day when the Lord Jesus is going to return with us to establish his kingdom, the millennial kingdom. So is the millennium the fullness of times? Is the millennium the period that's being spoken about in Ephesians chapter 1? Well, let's turn to Isaiah 11. Let's turn to Isaiah 11 and just remind ourselves of a wonderful picture of the millennium that's given all the way back in the prophecy of Isaiah. So I'm not sure whether I've <clears throat> mentioned this illustration to you already, but it's a favorite of mine because uh, I, I find it helpful when it comes to prophecy, especially in the Old Testament. If you were to uh, go back to my parents' house where, um, where they live in Inverness, they live just about 10 minutes walk from Loch Ness, you were to go down to the beach there, and on a clear day, I suppose like, like tonight, if you were to stand on the, the shore of Loch Ness and look down the line of it, it's really beautiful. Some of you will have been there, I'm sure. And what you see is layer upon layer of mountains disappearing into, into the foreground in front of you, right the way down towards Fort Augustus. And you can see layer upon layer of mountains. Now, the first mountains will be uh, in sharp relief. You know, you'll see every tree, um, you know, every every shrub, every rock, etc. The next layer of mountains, well, you might be able to make out uh, where some trees are, where the tree line finishes, but not much more. And then the furthest mountains in the future, in the, uh, not the future, but the in the foreground, well, they are just purple haze, aren't they? Just purple haze or, or, or dark brown haze. Well, the, the prophets of the Old Testament, they saw the future like this. They saw the future as layer upon layer of mountains. So they can see different mountain peaks in the future, but what they can't see is the valleys that separate them. So from the beach at Loch Ness, you can see all these peaks, but you can't see the glens in between them. You can only see the peaks. And that's what it's like when you read a book like Isaiah, because you can read one verse about the coming of the Lord Jesus to Bethlehem, and the next verse can be about his coming to rule and to reign in the millennium, and to the prophet, they're just two peaks right next to each other, and he doesn't see the great valley of time in between. Let's read Isaiah 11 and uh, the first uh, few verses here. Beautiful picture of the millennial reign of Christ. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. And of course, Jesse was the father of David, and the Lord Jesus is a descendant of King David. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes uh, by, his, uh, by what his ears hear, but with righteousness 
he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. So here we're not just dealing with an Israelite king. A king of Israel, a king of Judah, they can have no effect on the meek of the entire earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. A wonderful picture, uh, friends, a description of the reign of Christ uh, in a future day. Now, is this the fullness of times? Well, I believe it's a foreshadow. I believe it's a foreshadow of the, the fullness of times. But I want you to turn with me now to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Now, perhaps, uh, perhaps on a future occasion, uh, as I think I mentioned last week, we might look a bit more in detail at this chapter, chapter 20. Uh, but today I just wanted to take a slightly broader scope. But read with me from Revelation chapter 20. And um, actually, I'd like to read the last part of verse 3. The first three verses of Revelation chapter 20, we see that Satan, the devil, is being put on probation. He's being remanded in custody. And we read this at the end of that. After that, after that, so he's been bound and placed in, uh, in the bottomless pit. After that, he must be released for a little while. Now, as a Christian, you sit back from this, reading your way through Revelation, and you say, but why? If Satan is bound, if Satan is in the bottomless pit, if it looks as though his end has come, why on earth, in the sovereignty of God, would God release him? Satan can't release himself from this bottomless pit. He's not got the power to do that. Why on earth would he be released for a little while? And the answer comes in verse 7 and onwards. When the thousand years are ended, so that's the thousand year reign of Christ that we've just been reading of in Isaiah 11, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camps of the, the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Friends, I think I mentioned um, maybe last week that there's a, a revelation of Jesus Christ coming. But there's also going to be a revelation of sin for what it truly is. Remember, I think I told you about the fact that me and my cousin used to lift the paving slabs in granddad's back garden and all the beasties would scurry into the earth because men love darkness rather than light for their deeds are evil. And one day sin is going to be unmasked. The mask is going to drop and we're going to see sin for what it really is. And the very last gasp, the last gasp of sin, of opposition to God is what we've just been reading about here. This very final, very last rebellion, like the last spasm of an animal who's dying. This is the last gasp of sin uh, in its opposition against God. Satan has to be released because there will be people who are born during the millennium who are never born again. Even though they've got godly ancestors because only uh, godly people were into the millennium. We all know, sadly, don't we, that it's possible for people who have godly parents to be ungodly themselves. It's tragically uh, very possible and very common. So this will happen during the millennium and there will be those who will oppose Christ and revolt against him at the end of the millennium. So friends, I would suggest to you, and again, we'll look at that in a bit more detail um, if we have time another time. But I would suggest that that means that the millennium is not the fullness of times. It's not the fullness of times. There's a wonderful period but during that period, there will be sinners and there will be people who are opposed to God. There will be rebellion during the millennium, especially towards the end. Now, at this point, I want to uh, just point out something that I think is very interesting in the scriptures. You'll all be familiar with what a palindrome is. A palindrome being a word that is a word or a sentence that's the same forwards as it is backwards, like the name Hannah or uh, very simply the name Bob. It's a palindrome, the same forward as it is backwards. And some of you will know uh, full sentences that are palindromes. They read all the way 
uh, forwards as they do backwards. But, you know, the plan of the Bible, the plan of the Bible at the beginning and at the end is a bit like a palindrome. It's a bit like a palindrome. So let me try and, um, and sort of map this out for you. So I want to take you to um, the very beginning, the very beginning of things. And what do we start with? We start with eternity past, eternity past. And then what do we have? Satan's rebellion. Satan's rebellion, Satan falls from heaven. What follows that is the rulership of man, the rulership of man, that man uh, rules on the earth. Of course, sadly, under uh, Satan, uh, because he's the prince of the power of the year. So eternity past, and then Satan's rebellion, We've got the dominion of man, or the rulership of man. Then we've got the judgment of the fall. The judgment of the fall, now separated from Eden by the cherubim and the, and the flaming sword. And then what do we find later? We find a world united against God at Babel. A world united, a one world system, united against God at Babel. We're going to be like God. That's just what Lucifer said before he fell. We're going to be like God. And that same spirit now animates man in opposition against God. We're going to build a tower up to the heavens and be just like him. Now I want you to zoom forward in your minds all the way to what the Bible describes happening at the end. We start with a world united against God. There's going to be a world united against God all under one system and ruled over by the Antichrist uh, with false religion in hand. Then we're going to have the judgment of the tribulation, just like the judgment of the fall, this time a seven year period of God's wrath and judgment. And then not the rulership of man, but the rulership of Christ as he comes and establishes his kingdom for a thousand years. But then just as we had Satan's rebellion at the beginning, now we have Satan's last gasp at the end and followed not by eternity past, but by eternity future, when God will bring new heavens and new earth and the eternal state. Now, friends, uh, just as we make that observation, I just want to give a little caveat to that. Sometimes you'll see books for sale in Christian bookshops, um, or you'll see people talk about paradise lost and paradise regained. We begin with Eden, and we're going to end up with Eden, essentially. There's even a hymn, and it's actually a lovely hymn, so I hate to criticize it. Um, and I hate to crit criticize hymns in general because we all understand poetic license. And he's actually one of my favorite hymn writers. So uh, please don't see this as a criticism of him. Timothy Dudley Smith writes a lovely hymn, Name of All Majesty. And I'm sure that you all love it. I love it too, Name of All Majesty. Uh, but there is a line in it, which I just think needs tweaks just a little bit. And that is when he says, darkness defeated and Eden restored. Darkness defeated and Eden restored. Now, my only quibble with that is that what we will have in the presence of Christ in the new heavens and the new earth is far, far, far greater than Eden ever was. It's not simply the loss of something in the beginning and the regaining of it in the end. It's the loss of something in the beginning and the regaining of something amazingly superior to what we had in the Garden of Eden. So I hope you can understand. I'm not criticizing that hymn. I do actually love that hymn. Uh, but it's not just Eden restored. It's much, much greater uh, than that. Now, uh, a theme that runs throughout the whole Bible is the theme of separation. The theme of separation. And as we think about the eternal state, as we think about this fullness of times, I want to see how God will tie up the loose threads. Uh, we said that it will be perfect timing, perfect completeness, and perfect fulfillment. And as we think about that completeness, we see how God ties up all the loose ends of the tapestry uh, of history uh, in the fullness of times. Uh, now, let me take you back to Genesis chapter one, please. To Genesis chapter one. And begin at the beginning. Um, some of my friends make fun of me and they say, Ian, it doesn't matter what you are preaching on, you'll read something from Genesis and something from Revelation. You could be preaching on a, a miracle of Christ and you read something from Genesis and something from Revelation. But I don't make any uh, apologies for that because, as we've said, the Bible is one story and every part of it plays its part perfectly in that unfolding drama of redemption. So Genesis 1, and I'll just read from verse 1. 
Can I just pause to ask if you're hearing me okay? Okay, lovely. Genesis chapter one, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then here we have the first words of God. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. That's all I want to read. It's just those first words of God. God separated light from darkness. As we think about separation, we're going back to the past. And we remember that the most fundamental separation we read about in the Bible is the separation between light and darkness. And that theme will carry on all the way through the scriptures. And even now, and even in common parlance outside of, of Christianity, people talk about darkness as being wicked, sinful, uh, and wrong. And they talk about light as being good. Now, we all understand there's not anything inherently sinful about physical darkness. There's not anything inherently good about the day. You can be sinful in the daytime and you can be godly at night. But they have come to stand for good and evil. But then we move on, and um, we won't read, we won't go through the entire Bible tonight, I assure you. Um, but we read about another much more serious separation in the chapters that follow. And that is a separation between God and man, between God and man, between creation, uh, sorry, between creator and his creatures. But then there is another separation. A very important separation. And here I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7, please. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy 7. And we're reading from verse 6. And here God through um, Moses is really reiterating to his people their uniqueness. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. You could ask the question at that point, why God? Why have you chosen the Jews? Verse 7, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples, but it is because... The Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And we could read on again, wonderful chapter, but we'll stop there for the moment. This is so profound. It really is so profound. If a Jewish boy was to go in to the temple and to say to the rabbi, Rabbi, why does God love us? Rabbi, why, why has God chosen us? We're, we're always making mistakes. We're always grumbling. We're always mourning. We're always going away to other gods. Why does God love, love, God love us? The, the Pharisee or the Levite would be able to turn him to these verses and say, well, it's because he loves us. He loves us because he loves us. There's no human reason. There's nothing in us as people that makes God love us. He just loves us. And you know, friends, that's exactly the same reason that you and I would give. If somebody was to, from Bones was to come into your church and say, why does God love you? You wouldn't say, well, because we're a bit better than you. Uh, we're a bit better than the other folks in Bones. Um, You wouldn't say, oh, it's because we're cleverer and we've worked out these truths from the Bible or we're a bit more righteous really than the average person in Bones. You would say, well, it's because God loves us. It's because he's chosen to love us. He's loved us in Christ, and it's got nothing to do with us. And you, so we see that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are absolutely one and the same, aren't they? Their heartbeat is the same. It's a heartbeat of love. But here, again, we do have reinforced that important separation. We've had light and darkness, and we've had um, God and man, and now we've got Jew and Gentile. And the world is divided into Jews and into Gentiles. Now, of course, it's a, a very unequal division. There are very few Jews compared to a whole world of Gentiles, but it is still, in the eyes of God, an important distinction. Then the incarnation comes, of course, and the Lord Jesus comes to Bethlehem's manger. And I'd like to turn you to John's Gospel, please. John's Gospel in chapter one. 
John's Gospel in chapter one. And we cast our minds back to the first words of God. What were the first words of God? Let there be light. And light came into the world. But there was a, a day over 2,000 years ago when the true light came in to the world. Uh, verse nine, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, to the Jews, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children of God. Friends, that's you and me. That's you and me. We have believed in his name. I trust that's the case for everyone on the call tonight. We have believed in the name of Jesus Christ. And if somebody was to ask you tonight, what does Jesus Christ mean to you? You would say, well, how long have you got? How long have you got? He means everything to me. I can't imagine life without him. He's my savior. He's my master. He's my closest friend. He's my redeemer. He is my God. I believe in him. So we believe in Jesus. And as a result, then, friends, we've been given the right to become children of God, co-heirs with Christ. We are inheriting uh, this wonderful inheritance because of Christ. But we remember that that means there's a separation between children of God and those who are not children of God, those who are children of the devil, as the Lord Jesus Christ calls them. In Matthew 10, uh, the Lord says, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. There is a division that came about when the Lord Jesus came and preached the gospel and established the gospel here. Well, let's think about the church. In the present day, we've thought about all these past divisions and the division that we've dealt with last day, I suppose, is ongoing because there are more men and women and boys and girls becoming children of God uh, day by day all over the world. Hallelujah. And we wish it was happening more uh, in, in Bones or here in Fife. We wish it was happening more. That's our great longing and desire, isn't it, for the people amongst whom we live, that they would come to believe in Jesus and experience what it is to be a child of God. But in the present, uh, the church is one new man. The church is one new man. Now, if there were uh, some Jews who were to believe in Jesus in Bones, I don't know if there are any Jews in Bones, but if they were to believe in Jesus Christ and come and be part of your fellowship, you wouldn't make a distinction, would you, between you and them? You wouldn't say, oh, this is the Jewish part of Bones Baptist Church, and you sit over on the left, and uh, the Gentiles will sit over on the right. You wouldn't do that because you're one new man in Christ. They might be Jews, and you might be Gentiles, but you're one new man in him. And more than that, even, we have been entrusted with the message of reconciliation. Be ye reconciled to God. So not only do we demonstrate one new man between Jew and Gentile, but we have a message for the people of Bones, for the people of Fife. We can tell you how to be reconciled with God and, and end that separation between creator and creature. Now, uh, let's bring our thoughts to a close and turn finally to the fullness of times and turn to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. And we'll just make one or two very simple observations here before we close. Revelation chapter 21. Now, as we read this, I want you to try, friends, if you can, to bear in your mind all the separations we've talked about. Light and darkness, God and man, Jew and Gentile, and saved and unsaved, if you want to put it like that or children of God and children of the devil. Revelation chapter 21, and we'll begin at verse 1. And John is given this amazing vision. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Wow. Wow. The dwelling place of God is with man. I thought mankind was, was banished out of the Garden of Eden. I thought there was a, a cherry boom and a flaming sword, which meant that this would never be possible. Uh, but here it is. The whole story of the Bible has unfolded this story of reconciliation. The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And these verses here, they're so precious to every Christian, aren't they? There might be somebody on the call tonight who's going through real difficulty. 
um, and who is experiencing real personal pain. But it is true that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. So creation is going to be made anew. Also, he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Well, friends, we've dealt with that second separation, God and man. Now God is dwelling with man. And now down to verse 9. Down, down to verse 9. Now from verse 9, there is an amazing description of the new Jerusalem. And let's read uh, from, um, we won't read it all, but we'll, we'll read from verse 12. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. And that's remarkable. So 12 gates bearing the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. So there we have Israel, God's ancient chosen people, depicted and described right there in the New Jerusalem. But what about verse 14? And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So now we've got the church, Israel and the church, united here in the New Jerusalem, Israel and the church. So friends, God and man, that separation is gone. And now Jew and Gentile, that separation also is gone. That separation also is gone. Sin and its effects are gone forever. Sin and its effects are gone forever. But then down to verse 22. Down to verse 22. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And then this is wonderful. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Its lamp is the Lamb. Friends, remember the very first separation was what? Light and darkness. And now that separation is gone as well. That separation has gone as well. No need for it. No need for it. It's interesting that at the beginning of our Bibles, we have light before there's a sun or moon or stars. Have you ever noticed that? In the opening chapters of Genesis, God says, let there be light. And it's not until later that he creates the sun and the moon and the stars. So there's light that is created light. But then at the end of, the, uh, of our Bibles, we have uncreated light because we have this light that emanates from the Son of God himself. There's a, a hymn that we sometimes sing uh, in the assemblies, and uh, it's a lovely hymn, and it has this verse. Let me just read it to you. Throughout the universe of bliss, the center thou and sun, the eternal theme of praise is this, heaven's beloved one. Jesus Christ is at the very center of all of this. He's going to be the one who has our attention in heaven. Yes, there's going to be wonderful gates and wonderful foundation stones and all sorts, but the Lord Jesus is going to be the very focus of all of these things. So friends, we'll draw our thoughts to a close there. I wanted just to zoom out and to get this broad view of the Bible story, all leading forward to that wonderful time that we call the fullness of times. Amen.